What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Shardog.com. My name is Sean Sheehan, and today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Luke Thomas to talk about some of the biggest topics in the world of, of mixed martial arts. I was just talking to Luke beforehand. I was like, well, we, I do a lot of previews, do a lot of specific stuff, but the, the, the kind of the wider part of MMA is something I think we all need to talk about a little bit more, and, uh, and we'll delve into some of those topics today. As I said to Luke beforehand, if you want to talk about it for 30 seconds or 30 minutes, that, that's all good. But I won't keep you too long, Luke. Luke, thank you very much for uh, for being out with me today. How, how are you? How is, uh, we're, we're a month into the new year now. How has it been treating you? Has, has it been a good start to the year? I know you're very busy with the, the relaunch of your show and everything like that, but yeah. has, it, has it been a good start to the it's year? Been, um, it's, been, it's been interesting. It's been an interesting beginning of the year, but uh, so far, so good. I haven't hit, haven't hit any rough seas just yet. Knock on wood. Let's see how that goes. Uh, well, that's all, that's always a good way. With MMA, you never know. Here's the here's the first question I'll throw at you: How do you okay. keep how do you keep yourself positive in MMA? Because it's something I think uh, yesterday marked the, the the nine year anniversary of me doing the Severe MMA podcast. So I've been around for a a bit a bit as well, and it's tough to keep positive. And maybe we shouldn't always be positive covering the sport. But how do you keep how do you keep at it? How do you keep motivated? How do you how how does that grind? Uh, you know, not consume you, or does it sometimes? It does. I mean, I think it consumes everybody for a little while. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's possible to do what you do or do what I do and not be ultimately consumed by the grind, both in, in a few different ways. Sorry, I got something in my eye, so just please ignore me while I try to scratch this out. But the 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 short answer is, you know, someone asked me this the other day, and I'll I'll tell you uh, I, I, basically the same answer that I gave them. I don't know how it's possible to be in MMA for a long period of time and maintain the same relationship to it. It will change over time for good or for worse, but it has to, I mean, on the negative side, you know, you can just tell someone's a recent fan when they're like relentlessly positive, you know, or, or they're just stupid. I mean, there's that as well, but (laughs) more often than not, they're just new because if you've been around as long as I have, for example, where you've seen guys who were pre ultimate fighter get popular, then there's the boost of the sport afterwards. Then they have a little bit of a run, then they get out. Now they're in their forties and fifties and whatnot, even older than that in certain cases. And you see how completely financially or physically broken many of them are I, I, to, to look at something like that and then not ask yourself questions about the way the sport runs. You have to be deranged to not do that. You have something has to be wrong with you to not do that. Or even lived experiences I've had it with, what scandals and in, in gyms in my local area i live in washington dc for folks who don't know here in the united states and like we had a scandal in the gym i don't know how long has it been uh maybe eight, eight years ago something like that and seven eight years ago and what that does to you and how, how you evaluate your relationship to it so partly your relationship has to change to it over time um but i try to if i can actually introduce a positive note to it i mean once you do see how the sausage is made i don't think there's any going back to be honest there's no there's no going back to some halcyon days of how you first felt as like a great fan when you were early into your fandom or media experience but what i would say is like that doesn't mean you have to abandon it um now some people that it might mean that but it hasn't meant that for me i think for me man like um you know i've been in the sport for a long time and the kinds of things that you can understand with a long period of time to study something, you you have a lot of opportunity. And I think now I'm at a stage where, you know, just personally speaking, I get much more, much more out of you know, trying to pay attention to what is happening technically inside the cage, strategically inside the cage than I ever have. That has been a real source of joy for me. I love trying to uncover the plot of a fight, the strategies involved, the tactics, what it means. And I know there's something to be said for like using that to do previews. I don't even mean that. I mean, just, you know, I've had times where example, like, you know, where this is boxing, but it's all part of the same process for me where I was watching some tape on Bud Crawford. Then I saw something he did and uh, like a light bulb went off about like what he was trying to do. I didn't understand it the first time I had seen it. I was like, Oh my God, that is so cool. I have that OMG. That is so cool. Movement all the time, all the time. I have our feeling. I should say I have that all the time. So the answer is how do you not get burned out? Um, you on some level, I think you will on some level. I think you're going to lose your connectivity to different parts of the culture, depending on the way you look at life, but I would also, you know, try to ask people to step back and say, Hey, is there something in the sport that you really love, no matter what the case is through all of this? And the answer for that has been yes for me. And so I just try to focus most of my time and attention there. Yeah. I, I think the the last point you made there about 
taking yourself out of parts of it. I think that's very interesting because that's kind of something I've done as well. Like when I started following the sport, you know, just as a fan, even before I was covering it, I used to like follow every fighter on social media and see everything they're doing and know everything they're doing and, you know, be on the for like on the forums back in the day, you'd have, you know, Ian McCall was great in the forums or Michael Bisping or Tito and things like that. And you'd know everything they were doing. Now, I saw people yesterday talking about Jamal Hill and talking about how what he's like online. And I'm like, I don't think I've ever seen a Jamal Hill tweet. <laughs> I just, I'm completely away from that. And, you know, obviously, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't get as technical as you. I, try, I, I like to try to, I, I don't have that skill, but I like to try to. But I, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy previewing shows. I enjoy reviewing shows even more. There's nothing like, you know, getting on a podcast on a Sunday, talking about what just happened and breaking it down, especially if it's something as we'll transition here, like Volkanovski versus Makachev, the first one, like one of the greatest fights we've ever seen. That's the, the next thing I want to ask you about, about Volkanovski. I, so I reckon Dimitri Johnson is the best fighter of all time. We can, we can talk about greatest. You know, greatest is a different thing. You know, everyone else is brought into the greatest. We talk about best. We talk about fighting ability and all that. I reckon Dimitri Johnson, I, I'll get your opinion in a second. I want to ask you about Volkanovski. Where does he stand in that? Because for a while there... Yeah. I thought Volkanovski was right up there. If, like, Demetrius, GSP levels for me. And I want to have this conversation now because I feel like he's lost two fights and he's lost three. And he might lose again to Taboria because Taboria is very good. And we see, like, he's coming back pretty quickly from being knocked out. He's talking about his mental struggles along. Now, maybe he'll come back and win five in a row, right? Maybe he will. But if he doesn't, I feel like we need to have this conversation now before it gets like, ah, he was never that good anyway, which always happens with every fighter and the discourse goes that way. So that's the question I want to put to you. <laughs> How good is Alexander Volkanovsky technically in, in terms of yeah. all time? That's a big question. That's a big question. So to backtrack a little bit, like is Demetrius Johnson the best ever? He might be. He might be. I've never really sat down and like made an affirmative list. Here's my top five or whatever. Yeah. But like, I wouldn't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think like who would I put above that? Not again. Greatest separate conversation to the point that you raised. Yes. Just the best one. Um, he probably is the answer, right? He probably is the answer. So, using that as like a benchmark, you know, uh, in terms of like uh, the best. You know, it's funny, obviously going f that, that jump from 145 to 155 didn't do him any favors. I know that people think he overperformed in the first Makachev fight. I, I thought Makachev won that one 49, 45, 48, 47 at worst, you know, and then the rematch, which he, we all know he took under less than ideal conditions and it went, it went about as bad as it could have gone, all things considered. Um, so that I think has really put a dent in his uh, all time status, depending on what you want to say. But to answer the question as best I could, I would say two things. I would say the very, very, very best fighters, you know, and then there's obviously overlap with great there, but the very, very, very best ones, your Johnsons, Aldos, GSPs, Silvas, Fedor at heavyweight in his early run, or BJ Penn at his peak, or something like that. They do two things, right? One is that they make you all of a sudden reimagine what is possible. Like, you didn't even know someone could do that in MMA until they actually show it to you. And then you're like, holy shit. And then there ends up being this copycat effect. A very easy way to understand this is just yesterday was the, can you believe it, the 13th anniversary of Anderson Silva front kicking to the face, Vitor Belfort. And you might say, as we did say at the time, hey, we've seen this in like karate tournaments and whatnot. Yeah. But you had never seen someone in a UFC title fight do it that way. He made you reimagine what was possible. Um, the other thing I think that you would say is that for the very, 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 very best guys, um, they actually change the game a little bit, not just because they introduce a technique that a lot of people follow, but it's more than that. They actually have a way of operating or a specific kind of conceptual approach to the game that no one else had brought before that an individual technique might be a good example of a front kick to the face, for example. Um, but there's a broader skill set involved. And for me, Volkanovsky is not the first guy to involve feints and stance which is he's hardly the first guy to do that but the level at which he has combined first of all very underrated athleticism you did see some evidence of that in the makachev fight 
but more than that, I mean, I, I, I've, I've had a conversation with him one time and, and uh, he's like, the, the goal is to scramble their brains. I've never seen a guy put together so many variables at once, then change the variables, get reads on it, then change the variables, then change the variables and begin to completely dissect people of elite quality over and over and over and for long stretches of fights. Remember, he fought Aldo for 15 minutes. Aldo was never in that fight. He fought Max three times, the last of which was a total disaster for him. And, and what ends up happening is his ability to make um, adjustments between rounds in the middle of rounds, his ability to make adjustments between fights and everything else. It's a level of fight IQ and pattern setting and then pattern disruption um, that I think is second to none. I don't, I can't think of anyone who's been as good at that as him in the way in which it shows the absolute power when there might be, yes, he's physically quite strong, but he's going to be short. He's not going to have a long reach. These weapons, or the, I should say these limitations, never seem to matter. You never actually look at a reach differential and go, well, that's going to fuck Volkanovsky up this time. It never even is a role because the way in which he's able to maximize what uh, physical tools he has with extraordinary fight IQ through this use of variables and pattern disruption is uh is unlike anything the game's ever seen and i think for that reason um you you would have to put him in the pantheon of certainly in weight class all-time greats but among guys who changed the game when they got there i think volkanovsky deserves a nod uh, there's something i always say about volkanovsky is that he's so good we it's very hard for the layman to actually understand how good he is. Because as you say, yes. he, he hasn't really done anything game-changing, but he just does the fundamentals extremely well. Has uh, Maybe that's a question to ask. Has anyone ever done the fundamentals as well as he does? Like, I, I, always, mm. I always think a small guy who can beat, and not just necessarily bigger guys, because, you know, it's at 145, but, like, taller guys and get into range, you know, like your, your Floyds, your Mike Tysons back in the day in boxing. I always feel like, they they have to prove something a little bit more, right? Because there's all you can always be the bully, you can always be the, you know the, the John Jones, and there's nothing wrong with that. They're you know John Jones or McGregor one forty five great fighters as well, but to be the smaller guy and to dominate that way, I feel like it's something a little bit more special. But just to that point, then it's like it's hard to actually decipher, even for even for people who've been covering the sport or watching the sport for a long time, or even fighters themselves, to decipher just how good he is because he does it in such a detailed way. Yes, that's 100% true. And it, people have come around on him. So to answer the question, like, so it's, it's a great, great question. But like, for example, like, who has been better at the fundamentals? I would say GSP's overall command of the MMA fundamentals was pretty good. Uh, but, you know, to the point that you raised, he was not physically undersized. He was huge for the weight class. Yeah. He was a natural welterweight or whatever. But, you know, he was a big, strong, athletic dude, which only made everything else he did technically that much more difficult to deal with for his for his peers at his time. But Volkanovski's a little bit different. Right. Volkanovsky isn't he's, he's outsized in that way, but he's got this fucking, you know, uh, machismo like he, he was in the he had he was inside Makachev's body triangle. I think it was like round four or something. And he's screaming at him, like punching him over the shoulder, like a totally disadvantageous position. But he's got this. Uh, I don't want to call it Napoleon complex because that actually, I think, degrades what people of smaller stature aim and try to do. I don't mean it that way, but I mean. He's got the he's got this incredible spirit of com, of fire that he adds to this thing, which I do think that you, know, you look at the results he's had. Then he's got this competitive spirit. He gets these great results. He finished off Yair. He beat the living shit out of Ortega and then getting out of that uh, that 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 uh, guillotine choke. He's got this ridiculous resolve those things people actually do pay attention to those things people can see and they're like wow this is incredible but to your point there's all this other shit he's doing that people don't have a fucking clue <laughs> they don't have a clue you know and it, it, it and even me and and famously i've been mean for but it's like taken me a lot of time in various intervals to be like okay what the fuck is he doing in this moment that they, they, there is so much layered complexity to it it's like my, my wife you know she used to ask me like how does tom brady always find the receivers i know you got your irish but you you guys know he was the best at that position and 
you got to understand there's 32 NFL teams in the world. There are maybe, maybe 15 guys who you would call good. There's like three guys who are elite and Brady was like better than all of them. So it's just like this very weird skill that he was able to develop. It's like, how does he always find the receiver? Like, I don't even understand it. It's like, you know, he, he's got a certain command that is hard to explain unless you know the X's and O's of, of that. But there's other things you can pick up on him about what you like. People get some of the really cool parts about Volkanovsky, but I completely agree with you. There's so much excellent detail to what he does that unless you have a really trained eye and you've gone through with it, it just gets missed, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. Let's go from the very, very top of the 145 slash 155 division to someone who's trying to enter into that division and Paul Hughes. And I know you, yeah. I know you've looked at Paul Hughes and you know, I'm, I, I, I wanted you to talk about this and I mentioned you before Ed, because there's a bit of Irish bias, obviously for me and people are going to say, Oh, you're talking about this guy and he's not as good. And you talked about all these other guys and they lost and all that. But like, well, we had Conor McGregor and Ian Gary, so we're doing okay. But I look, I think Paul Hughes is brilliant. What's your opinion on Paul Hughes? As someone who, who has watched him uh, for a good while now and has been talking about him for a good while, are you, first of all, how good is he? Second of all, are you still amazed he's not in the UFC or the BFL or Bellator yet? It's, it's crazy to me. Anyway. Let's back up a step. What is the story? Why isn't why haven't we seen him in a major promotion? I mean, Cage Warriors, all respect to them. It's yeah. an important promotion. They do great work. But why haven't we seen him somewhere else? So What's I, the story? I interviewed him just before his last fight. So he was out for like um, around a year and then he had a cage warriors fight and won that in like, you know, 30 seconds. or whatever. So I interviewed him before that and I asked him these questions. And basically, so he was, the UFC offered him a Lerone Murphy fight uh, and he wasn't able to take it. I think he was, uh, so one fight he was injured and another fight there was visa issues because it was supposed to be on in the US. So they actually offered him two fights and mm. both of them fell out. So... Like, I don't know whether it's one of those things like, well, you got offered twice. And I think there was a contender series thing as well a while back and that which he didn't want. So it's one of those things like, oh, okay, you've turned us down a few times. Or is it one of those things like the next opportunity, you will get it. Like during that interview, he seemed to be pretty positive about it. But there's only so much time you can wait as well. There's a Cage Warriors Dublin show coming up in, in a couple of months time as well. Is he going to be on that? Who knows? But yeah, that's the situation at the moment. I think he's okay. still in a waiting pattern, but they know him and they like him, I think is 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 a big part of it. Is that okay. is that lasting? Who knows? I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I you know, the Irish ride for their own, like quite like <laughs> more than any other group I've maybe have ever seen. Um I think Listen, I'm not one of these guys who I don't have the time to go through. And it's like, here's my list of the top 50 prospects in MMA. And it's from all of these places you've never heard of. And it's all these guys you've never heard of. I do not know where Paul Hughes ranks among the folks who do that kind of a thing. It's worth asking them. But at least in terms of what I have seen from him, uh, I, I remember I know it was, it was it was random luck, actually. I remember just being like there was the um, he had the rematch. He lost to the kid the first time. His, his name is a V. He's covered in uh, Jordan, Jordan Vucinic. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I had actually just stumbled upon that fight before it was supposed to happen. And I watched it. I'm like, who the fuck is this kid? He's unbelievable. I mean, just don't take my word for it. Look at the ways in which he finishes opponents. His grappling is lights out and technical. His stand up, he can do it from all different ranges. And more to the point, like, look at how well balanced he is. Look at how good his timing is. He never falls over his skis. His timing is always, or not always, but certainly is very, very, very good, both in wrestling and in striking. His range management is good. He's highly technical. He's got all of these things you look for, both in terms of technical development relative to his age as well as like what are his athletic gifts here and how does it all work together he's beating these guys not just because he's technically better than them and also a good athlete but he marries everything so smoothly right you can pinpoint individual strengths in of his game but it there is a level like there's no firewalls between them there is just this inter uh, there's just this flow between everything that is so smooth. It belies the fact that he hasn't fought on a bigger stage, PFL, well, built or whatever. And then certainly um, a UFC to this point, he is more, more than UFC ready. So I, I don't know where he ranks. You would know better than me among like Irish prospects, but I can tell you f far beyond UFC ready, far beyond 
I agree with him. It would be a waste of his time for me for him to go on Contender Series, an absolute waste of everyone's time, including his. He is absolutely ready for the big show, has been for some time, and I'm sad to hear what you're saying. I hope they can resolve it because this is a guy I think a lot of people would benefit from seeing. He is a special, special guy. It's it's true, and there's another that Jordan Virginia fight you you watched the second fight especially, like it was five rounds of an absolute beatdown. If you Google Jordan Virginia's face, like it's like you went to a meat grinder. But the problem with that is that I I think, oh, well, this is maybe another discussion. But I think the UFC needed about two more matchmakers to be honest, because a lot of times they look at the results, mm. and and you know obviously I deal a lot with Irish MMA fighters who are on the brink of getting to the UFC, and what they're told an awful lot is oh. You went to the decision in your last fight. We're looking for people who finish people, even if it was like 50 43. And he, <laughs> there was one of the, you know, one of the most insane uh, showings of heart anyone has ever showed from Vucinic, who is a UFC worthy fighter as well, an unbelievable fighter. You know, you mentioned a few other prospects like Danny McCormick is the Invicta champion. She should probably be uh, in the UFC as well. And there's a few more as well. But, you know, a lot of the, the Irish fighters were signed over the last year because there was supposed to be an Irish show and then it didn't happen. But, yeah, we're, but Paul Hughes is, he's number one, definitely. And I, I think, it, I think okay. it'll happen within the next few months and I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, yeah, I mean, the last thing to your point, I mean, he, yeah. you know, in that, in that uh, rematch uh, you referenced, he didn't get the finish. But, like, I look at it like, okay, do you have five round experience against a quality opponent on a big show before you get to the UFC? Yes. How did you look? Fucking awesome. These are things that when I think about how it's going to go for him at the next level, I'm like, right, that is going to serve him super well to say nothing of like the level of skill and everything else that he's got that just that kind of thing alone to me is so much more valuable than like, well, we'll see how he, can he get the knockout on the contender series? I don't give a fuck about any of that. That's, that is my contender series right there. And he passed that test with flying colors. Give that guy a contract yesterday. A hundred percent. And it's, it's funny because you mentioned that the, the five round thing. Uh, there, that was there was a talk with that with um, uh, with Duplessis coming into the fight recently. That he doesn't have the five round experience, but and I even said it on a podcast. I think and someone mentioned it to me. Well, he actually prepared for I think at least two five round fights in KSW against Roberto Saldic. You know who is mm -hmm. you, you know UFC worthy as well. To just have that preparation is massive, but to have the actual fight itself is huge as well to, to prepare you for going to the very top level, as we've seen with Duplessis. And I don't think Manny would be shocked if Paul Hughes went to the top level as well, and hopefully hopefully he will. Um, I have to, uh, in case we run out of time here, I have to ask you about my favorite topic in judging. Uh, what's, what's your thoughts? I'll just I'll just throw it at you. What's your thoughts on MMA judging as, we, as we're in 2024? I, I feel like people... I feel like the discourse on judging now is coming from a more factual point of view than it's ever come from. I'll pat myself on the back for that one. You know, it was on me. But the the problems, I think, have become more specific in terms of the solutions we want. I know I've listened to you talk before, and I, I kind of veer the other way, but I very much understand your thing about wrestling has been taken out of mixed martial arts through the judging and grappling to a certain extent has been uh, lessened because of the judging criteria and what they're looking for. Overall on judging, where are you with it? What adjustments would you like to make? And what do you think the standard is like from, from your point of view in, in 2024? I think in general, I'm with you. I mean, we probably agree much more than we don't agree. I think in general, um, you know, and for folks who have not been around for a long time, you know, people being like judging's worse than it's ever been. I mean, you're just, no, ridiculous. Just, no, that's so <laughs> no, no, not, not in any. <laughs> Dude, I cannot tell you how many like months in a row in like 2005 or six. You don't have as many events, but like, in, so then obviously any kind of issue is more pronounced. And you're like, they've got nothing but boxing judges there, guys who don't, like, or ladies who know like literally fuck all about MMA. Like, you don't really have that problem anymore. Um, so like just on that level alone, it's gotten much better to say nothing of like the criteria and whatnot. I mean, on some level, I have some of the same standard complaints, right? You, you've got variations in commissions in the United States. Um, and so you just don't know, hey, they're in Utah this week. They're in Texas. They're in Florida. And then like everything changes. So that's a little bit of an issue. I think another issue I don't have a great I don't have a great solution for it is just like there's just vast differences in judging ability like there is in fighting ability, right? So you can get a professional grade UFC level fighter, you can get a professional grade UFC level judge, so to speak. One of the better ones that I like, I think you agree with this, would be Ben Cartilage. I think Ben Cartilage is a phenomenal judge. Yeah, you know, I really, I, 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 his scorecards always to me are like a good way to judge where you're at on stuff. You know, 
So, but there's also guys who are not great. And, um, and so that, I think the only thing I really look at these days, aside from the standard complaints and probably where we do have a little bit of difference, here's where I'm at on this, you know? And by the way, I don't know exactly what the fix is. So it's not like I'm like, I have an idea. I'm just kind of observing things. What we want, it seems to me, out of the scoring criteria is at times to incentivize certain things and then at times to not do that, but just to kind of stand back and sort of have a way to grade it. And where we do that and where we don't do that can be uh, uneven. It's not in all places. But it, uh, one thing that is happening that I do not love is what you kind of alluded to previously, which was that if you're looking at how grappling and wrestling are judged today, one thing that I am seeing, and again, this is also inconsistent too, right? So like a good judge will like fine tune it where you don't really feel this, but a lesser judge in my view may get this wrong where they'll say, Hey, unless you've moved to like a really advanced position and then there's visible ground and pound and, or some kind of submission threat, you know, what really was the value of changing the fight from standing to the ground and on some level there is obviously like i i remember why they created these rules because guys would take other people guys down sit in their guard for 15 minutes and then get their hand raised you'd be like what the what is this why are we doing this shit and so we're trying to solve for that but the problem is i don't think it's nuanced enough and and i i'm one of these people that tends to think that you need to make rules more simple and less which is why i'm telling you i don't have a decision or i, I don't have a, a a change to this that i think automatically fixes it but I'll just give you like where I'm at on this one. It, to me, the sum total of grappling or wrestling's benefit cannot be that it is only if you reached an advanced position. It is only if you get to a submission or close to one or you like threaten it or only if you have savage ground and pound. These are certainly significantly more benefit um, beneficial and then obviously should count in a way that matters. But I just don't actually think that it does that. I think that there are ways in which if you don't want to get taken down, you get taken down. Even if you can fight well underneath, this can disrupt your game plan. Um, if you get to places where you have two guys who can't do a whole lot, but one has something the equivalent of riding time on the other one. Not control time, but riding time comes from collegiate wrestling in the United States. We're not trying to borrow those rules, but there can be some kind of benefit to that. There are ways in which I'm not asking for a wholesale change. But what I am kind of saying is if we get to the end of a bout and the most we can say for the grappling is, well, did you get close to a submission and did you get, you know, did you visible hardcore ground and pound? If you don't get that, then we just were really not going to count it. And so I worry on two levels. One, what that might incentivize as a change to MMA, because what I don't want to happen is guys all of a sudden realize over time well, if I don't get, if I can't pass guard to mount, if I can't take his back, I'm not, I'm not going to get any value of this. What does that do to then changing game plan such that you just get less wrestling overall? Is that really what we want? That's a question I would have. And then the second part is I actually do think there's something to be said for um, rhythm disruption, for riding time, for the, what, what benefit does control confer if it can, by the way, slow down an opponent over time and uh, minimize um, offense potentially in both directions, but enough where one person was kind of leading the dance. These kinds of things still matter to me, and I don't see them show up in ways that, you know, let me be clear, I would prefer. That would be the thing that I would spotlight. I, I think that's very interesting. I, I would... I would agree up to a certain point, because there's a, there's a certain point you reach with that if you go all the way where we're back to, you know, John Fitch 50-45 fights, and it's... People always bring him up. <laughs> Poor old John Fitch. Yeah, Poor but, John Fitch yeah. gets killed for this. It's so does, funny. Yeah. Does. But that, we don't want that, right? We, we want the rules to be written, in my opinion, anyway, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, obviously, but to be written to where we're looking for a finish. But at the same time, there's there's a, there's a word or a phrase in the uh, in the criteria that I think we could use to solve this problem a little bit, and it's fighting spirit, or d diminishing the fighting spirit. Right, so if yes. we if we see that the wrestling is diminishing their fighting spirit, like in a, in a genuine way, I think the judges should look at that more and weigh that more heavily. So here's here's two examples, right? Logan Storley MVP. In my opinion, that fight, he didn't diminish his fighting spirit at all. He just laid on him. Agreed. He didn't do anything, and I think MVP yeah. should have won that fight, right? But and that's that, that's another debate because I think the European versus the American judges can be a little bit different as well. But that's a debate for another day. Mm -hmm. And then you look at any Murab Dashvili fight. So he's wrestling. It, it's like 
if you look at it, it's very ineffective in terms of actually getting to a position to dominate from a position to land a lot of shots to get uh, a submission, right? Because, like, the, Mirab has the record for, like, the most takedowns in a fight. That's that's actually useless under the criteria because the criteria wants you to get one takedown and start punching people, basically. But the way he fights diminishes his opponent's fighting spirit. And I think he should get paid for that, basically, and get scored more heavily. But yeah, we will. Uh, maybe that's a longer discussion for another day. Luke, our time is up, but I have three questions, quick fire questions to end it with. Okay. Who is the best welterweight in the world? Currently. Yes. Yes. I don't want to take it from Leon, but I think Shafkat Rachmanov will be that answer oh, if you ask me in years time. Interesting, interesting. I thought I thought you might go uh, uh, Megan Medkarimov. I thought you might go Jason Jackson, but I thought Leon Edwards is a good answer. I'd I'd go. Uh, uh, I think I go Jason Jackson. There, I'm a big Jason Jackson fan. I think he's brilliant. Okay, I, I wouldn't hate that. I don't. I don't hate that. Who's the best heavyweight in the world? Tom Aspinall. <laughs> Mm-hmm. See, this is one of the topics that I really wanted to get into. I think Tom Aspinall, I don't think there's ever been a fighter as... I, I, overrated is, the, is very much the wrong word, right? But rated as highly as Tom Aspinall with doing so little. I don't think it's ever happened. And I think so, he's a very so, good fighter. But So what I would say is... what well, I mean, the, the hype around Hamza for a while was like the most insane shit ever. True, but true. Uh, to your point, yes, like... This is what I always tell people. I know it's rapid fire, so I'll make it fast. What I always tell people is you'll see someone come into the UFC and they'll have like 10 first round finishes. And what you can obviously tell if you've got 10 fights and 10 first round finishes, like this is a, this guy can punch his fucking ass off, right? He's like really, really good at it. But it also means that they've not been audited yet. And what will always happen in the UFC, 100%, it will happen. You don't know when it will happen. They will eventually get audited. They might pass the test, but they're going to get audited. Tom Aspinall has not been audited. He has not been audited, which means we don't have big answers to important questions. So I'm guessing when I say it, but I, I have I, I feel cautiously optimistic in saying Tom Aspinall. Okay, last question. Who's going in the Super Bowl? Ooh, fuck me. Probably the Chiefs because I fucking hate them. I'm not <laughs> I'm not one of these American goobers who's like, I hate the Chiefs because Travis Kelsey is you know, Dayton Taylor Swift. I don't even give a shit about any of that stuff. I, dude, you don't even, this is, I'm so glad you asked this question. <laughs> I am so tired of the chiefs. Do you understand? I don't even know what the equivalent would be, but if, if in, in, if I root for the Washington commanders, okay. One of the worst fucking teams in the league. But when I was a kid, they won three super bowls. Like it was the biggest thing. And now they're, they're terrible. I had to go through an entire 17 week season where they went three and 14. And I was listening to sports talk radio every single day about this Patrick Mahomes who's the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs he's been with that team six years okay six years they've gone to the Super Bowl in four of them and the other two where they didn't they went to the conference championship which is the game before that and they only lost in overtime it is a level of success that is impossible for me to imagine as a commander's fan it is so far apart and the 49ers by the way are not some like hard luck story these are like you know blue bloods too so fuck them too but just because i'm sick of the kansas city chiefs even though they're an excellent team i'm gonna root for the 49ers but the chiefs are gonna win the chiefs are gonna win I like it. I, I I can't. Uh, so um, you know your national sport NBA, our national sport hurling here. My team Limerick. We went forty five years without winning in All Ireland, and yeah, and we've won five of the last six, and uh, we've won the last four okay. in a row. So this year we could be the first team in one hundred and fifty years to win five in a row. So I'm like, Ooh. I'm just basking in glory now. After <laughs> my whole life, I've never never won anything. So I'm uh, I'm rooting for the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm on the winners' trail now. Fuck Man United. Fuck all that bad stuff. I'm on, I'm like Real, I'm a Real Madrid fan now. We're we're just winners here. Luke, thank winners you very only. much. Winners, winners only. only. Fuck them losers. Fuck them losers. Luke, thank you very much for the time. I really appreciate it, and uh, I definitely want to get you back on again to do this because uh, I. I really enjoyed this. Thanks very much, Luke. Let's do it anytime. Thank you, buddy.